Hello everybody, today this is Dutchman2530 doing a video that I have long since wanted to do, um, and since I've been playing one of my characters that I decided to restart from scratch recently, I decided that I should, well, make this video finally. So today I'll be talking about the bleak yet stunning, how do you say, a recovery of destiny and I shall also be doing a review so I will not be going over very much what's going on like what exactly happened because there are too many videos out now talking about exactly how you know destiny failed early on and how it became like you know what it is now I'm mainly going to talk about the game as it is now or during my playtime of the game and talk about it and for anybody who thinks like oh I've never seen you play destiny or like oh like you know how, how should I know your opinions valid well, I have over 4,400 Grimoire score, which basically anywhere in 4,000 you've made three characters and gotten them pretty much max level. Um, I've played the game for, I think it's almost 300, 400 hours. I've done every single raid, I just haven't, the only one I never completed was King's Fall. Um, and I've done most of the quests in this game, including, like, you know, the, what I like to call the Triumph quests. And also the rest of the quests, such as like you know all the story missions, all that. So I have done everything that can be functionally done on this game, besides obviously like you know a few specific exotic quests here and there, which those are raid quests and the one raid that I didn't complete. But I have fought the last encounter, so regardless, that should explain why I'm able to talk about this game. Um, I will try to be as objective as possible, but. I do love this game at the end of the day, so there should there might be a bit of pandering for me. Regardless though, let's get into this by talking about how I got my hands on this game, and why, honestly, this game grew dear to my heart very fast, and some of my early experiences. So, where did I begin playing Destiny, and how did I get here? So originally my uncle, who I won't name here, um, had this game back in year one and I played it um, um, a little bit with him when he was around. Um, that ended up becoming basically my catalyst for playing this game, namely because I in the times I did play with him I was able to unlock Pocket Infinity, pre-patched, and super good advice during both of their exotic quests. Um, when I first actually started getting into Destiny, though, was around the two months after the Taken King launched, which was when I bought the Taken King because a friend of mine, who we may all know from the channel, Chris, um, yeah, he told me, you know, he was playing this game nonstop, and he said, you know, you should definitely get it, bro, and I'm like, sure. So, I got the game, I started playing, and almost instantly I fell in love with it. Um, mainly just because the shooting mechanics and the way the game feels is so good. Like, you never feel like, you know, anything anything that was missed, you don't feel like you're, you actually feel like you're missing. Like, just, everything just feels so smooth and, like, polished in the actual gunfights themselves that it honestly makes me feel like I'm, like, I'm actually shooting it a little bit. Um, but regardless, the biggest issue I had early on was that I couldn't really understand the story very much, which is kind of obvious because the base game story and... The first campaign, the um, first DLC story was kind of lacking, but once I got to House of Wolves and the Taken King, which was at the time the newest expansion, that was when things really began to light up. I got very hard, in, well, I got very deep into the lore, including started watching like you know lore channels, um, Mylan Games being probably the the one I watched the most of, and. Eventually, um, with the help of Chris and a few other people, I began to do some of the end game activities. Uh, specifically, I played Trials and um, Iron Banner for the first time, and that was when I was almost 20 light level under. And basically, the Taken King, I never got to max level in that in that mode. I barely, I only got to play the raid three times while I was even there. And that was at the very end of the lifespan of the Taken King. Um, but I played the game a lot still. And then Rise of Iron came, which basically was my walking son. I 
I didn't get Rise of Iron until months after it released. I think it was like three or four months because I didn't have the money. Um, eventually I did get it though, as a gift, and I basically min-maxed my way all the way up to play it, being able to play the raid, which was just at this point still out in, um, I believe it was still out in the, uh, what you would call it, the, um, the normal mode. I don't remember if hard mode had been released yet or not. Probably did, but I just don't remember it. Um, and then I did the base mode of the raid, which I completed quite easily. <laughs> um... Yeah, so that's, like, just a brief overview of what, like, of what my early time in Destiny was. Um, next up, we'll actually start starting to review the game, talk about what its issues are, what are its faults. Um, and this will be starting with PvP, because PvP is by far the most controversial of all of them, so I want to get them out the way now. And then I'll start talking about the PvE content, which makes up a majority of the game. And then I'll obviously start talking about the sandbox, so on and so forth. So with that... Let's begin the descent into madness that is talking about how Destiny 2, or not Destiny 2, Destiny 1 functions. So for those who don't know, the Crucible is the PvP game mode of Destiny. Um, this game mode revolves around three, well, it revolves around a bunch of rotating modes that do different things, namely being, um, the two standouts being, um, Control and Clash, which is basically TDM. Um, and the way that the game works is instead of running off of the standard get X amount of kills or get X amount of points, you know, just capturing objectives, they opted for kills and objectives matter. So basically, getting kills while you have more objective gives you more score, at least in control, and so on and so forth. So the mode is really based around, um, or the Crucible in any objective mode is more based around the objectives, but it still gives meaning to those who are, you know, just kill things. Um, PvP is generally 6v6, I believe it is. Um, I have seen bigger lobbies, obviously, and you can have custom games, which can, which I've seen increase the number on each team. Aside from that, however, um, the Crucible is pretty much your standard, um, just your standard PvP mode for any game. Basically, it's just like if you took Call of Duty, but translate it over to Destiny. Um, Destiny itself, with this, kind of makes it unique, though, because in-game, and I'll talk about, you know, the specific modes like Trials and that in a second, but, um, every weapon is then, is, um, standardized. So what that means is, is that based on rate of fire, and, um, yeah, rate of fire, mostly, um, they categorize what damage your weapon does and so on and so forth. So the weapon functions the exact same as it would in PvE, but the difference is that the weapon damage they do is, ba is based on what, um, what their fire rates are. So in this case, you have archetypes of weapons, which basically they all fall around the same fire rates. You have weapons such as slow rate of fire pulse rifles, which, um, with certain perks, which I'll talk about in the sandbox section, can make them two burst kills or three burst kills, and they are always going to be like that. As where you go and look at a medium RPM pulse rifle, it takes around anywhere between three to four bursts to kill, so on and so forth, and with that you kind of see how it works. Scout rifles, which are basically DMRs, they take... Anywhere from four to, or no, anywhere from five to three, on average. The hand cannons take anywhere from three to five or three to four, um, and so on and so forth. So, the games are basically a lot more balanced than you would expect, and they also make it to where your other weapons, which I'll we'll talk about later in the sandbox, are also standardized, such as snipers and stuff like that. Um. But your light, a big thing is that your power or light level in this game, which is the culmination of what your gear is, um, that does not determine how much damage you do in PvP at all. Your power level or light level in this game, obviously, um, does not matter. So you can come in there with a level 1 weapon that, has only, that does only 5 damage, and it'll do the same damage as a level 40 maxed out. 400 light weapon of the same archetype. Obviously, perks are a bit different, but regardless, same point. Um, overall, this makes PvP much more balanced. 
However, um, in the modes known as Trials and Iron Banner, um, both of these which are no longer available, sadly, um, because they were limited time modes, I wish they would, would have just kept them on like a weekly rolling basis, but they don't, but regardless. Um, these modes had something called light level advantages enabled. What this means is, is that these modes, your power does matter. So if you were going into a lobby with people who were, let's say if the 400, which is max light level, if you're going up against a team that's 400 light and you're going in there with like, you know, 370, you're going to do less damage than them and they are going to do more damage to you. as how power level works. So you cannot bring in terrible weapons or weapons that just, you know, aren't up to snuff in power level. This is where you bring your best weapons, the weapons you've leveled up and made sure that they are completely maxed out. You bring those weapons in, and that's because of the fact that they drop not only some of the the highest power level weapons in the game, so they drop, like, weapons that can be up to the max light level, but all those weapons also have, um, are considered some of the best in their category. Um, one good example would be an Iron Banner, which is actually the first Iron Banner I ever played in, gave me the LMG known as Bromart's stand, and it is one of the best machine guns in the game. But, the issue was is that at the time, I was under light leveled for it, so I had to work really, really hard in order to get the weapon, and even then, the weapon still wasn't max light level, because I wasn't max light level at the time, or I wasn't close to max light level at the time. And that's sort of the way this um, that mode goes. So that's really it on PvP as a whole. Um, I like the mode. There's a few problems I have with it, but they're not they're not game breakers. Mostly, like I said, this mode basically just seamlessly changes the PvP and, or the PVE aspects of the game and makes them viable in a somewhat competitive setting. So next up, we'll talk about story missions and strikes, which are the two um, main ways you are going to be leveling up or getting new gear and so on and so forth and then we'll start talking about what goes on behind that. Okay, so PvE content namely starts with um, story missions. This is how you basically progress through the game. Um, this includes you know, your standard story missions, so on and so forth, and then you have what are called open world missions, um, which are, like, bounties and other, like, story missions that just require you to go and, you know, do things in the open world. So, I'll get into that in a minute, but... Simply put, um, you can go into the open world at any time doing a, what is called a patrol, and these patrols can give you bounties to do in the actual system, as well as you can also obtain bounties for PvP and other things um, by talking to vendors and such like that in the tower, which is the main social space and or the um, the winter peak, but regardless. So mainly what happens is, is that you talk to these people, you talk to the people that give you quests, so on and so forth, the characters, and then they give you your quests, they give you whatever bounties maybe you may need, and then you go and do them. Like I said, some of them require you going onto the open world and completing events or killing and you know waves of enemies. Others make you go through a narrative-driven story mission, such as like you know you're hunting down this one dude that you know is a big issue, and you have to you know the entire like an entire chain of like two to three missions is just you hunting him. Um, Generally, story missions don't give you that much, although some missions, especially in the Taken King, do give you some good things. Um, at the end of the Rise of Iron campaign, you are given a um, exotic sword. Um, though it's a bad exotic sword, they still give you one. You also have the um, the Malak side quest line for the Taken King, which gave you the sword Dreadfang, which was the first sword you can obtain in the game. Um, and so on and so forth. The main way you will be leveling up after you finish your story of basically most of the campaign and doing or most of the campaigns and story missions are one of three things, um, depending on what expansions you have and or what you wish to do. So one is strikes. This is open to everyone. Simply put, strikes are specific, um, almost story-like missions. 
but they are a lot harder and they're a lot bigger. Um, simply put, they're similar to dungeons in other video games, but on a slightly smaller scale for most uh, for most people, at least from like an RPG background. And these are basically the main way you get loot. So what they do is, is you go through the mission, you know, you do whatever you need to do, you fight the final dude, and then at the very end there is a chest that drops. Now there's a item you can get called the skeleton key, which you can get multiple of them, and you need those to open up said chests. And every strike in the game has a um, unique loot drop that can spawn in it. A good example would be um, well, there's two places um. The Strike, the Nexus, and Undying Mind both have the ability to drop the um, the weapon known as the Imago Loop hand cannon, which is a very good hand cannon, as where just the Nexus can drop the Nexus class mod, and the uh, or the Nexus um, cloaks, or whatever they're called, depending on who you, what character you are, and so on and so forth. So that's one of the main ways you'll be leveling up, essentially, because you can get blues and all that, which are basically like stepping stones, and you basically get most of your gear and most of your farming comes through there. A step above those are the um, are the nightfall. So the nightfall is the highest. Basically, you're going in there, and the enemies are close, if not max power level. So basically, you have to be very close to being maxed out in order to do them. But what they give you is they give you the highest um, drop chance in the game. And there's a bounty associated with it called Sunrise. Where if you complete the... Um, if you complete the um, Nightfall on max... Um, with max what's called um, score level. Because basically killing enemies and doing certain actions gives you score. And then if you get a certain amount of score in that mission you get medals based on your performance. If you get a gold medal in the Nightfall, um, you can use that bounty, and that bounty has the chance to give you not only a specific exotic weapon, but it can also drop you any number of exotic, any um, any exotic or legendary from it. Um, and at the end of the mission, when you finish the Nightfall, it, you also have a chance to get exotic, strange, strange coins, special legendary, so on and so forth. So those are basically like your pinnacle way of getting gear. Um, the other two PvE, um, or big PvE contents, um, besides the raids, which I'll talk about later on, um, are the Prison of Elders, slash Challenge of Elders, and the, um, Archon's Forge. So, Prison of Elders is sort of like an arena-based mode. It's similar to a strike, but instead it happens the same way every time. Simply put, um, during the, um, you have a four-round system where you can, where you basically fight waves of enemies in their own, like, sort of terrarium system, and then you keep going back to the center once you beat three waves, and then once all, um, once every single area is beaten, there is a, a random location within there will spawn a boss that you must fight, and then once that is done, you may then go to a treasure room beneath the arena and open it up, and that has a chance to give legendaries, exotics, so on and so forth. Um, Challenge of Elders is similar, but instead of doing it like that, they make it to where you face, um, every round you face bosses, and you only face three of them, and what you are trying to do is, is get the most score possible, because the more score you get, the better chances you get of getting, um, certain items, and you also gain a, um, you also get bounties, which can drop you legendary weapons and gear specific to that mode. Finally, we'll go over Archon's Forge. This is a... Basically, it's a mode where you put in an item that drops throughout the Plaguelands, which is the area where the um, the Rise of Iron campaign takes place. You put the item in. You fight dudes. You kill the boss when the boss spawns. You get loot. That's it. And finally, we will talk about raids. So raids are six-player... Um, instances where you must go in and there are a um, they are all structured fairly differently but they all follow a somewhat similar pattern and that is the fact that you have a certain number of bosses and encounters within the raid that basically have their own unique mechanics their own unique fighting style so on and so forth and you must then fight them complete the mechanics and kill them um 
an encounter area when you complete an encounter generally chests will spawn around in at the end of the encounter and or there will be chests that you can find in between encounters and these have chances of dropping exotics legendary specific items from the raid stuff like that um, killing bosses will give you the raid weaponry and potentially raid armor or other items that pertain to the raid um, and generally that's what you do um, there are four raids in Destiny 1, each of them with their own unique sort of setting. Um, but regardless, raids are sort of the pinnacle content of the game. This is where you want to go when you have, you know, like, you know, you and your group of friends have all, like, you know, they've all gotten to the top and they want to basically um, get some of the best weapons in the game. They want to go and raid. Okay, so for the... Final review before, or the final explanation before I go into, um, what I dislike and what I think is right and what I think was wrong about the game, I will talk about the sandbox, how guns work, so on and so forth. So let's get into it, and let's finish this up. Okay, so now we get to the most important part of the game, which is the sandbox and overall the core mechanics. So simply put, there is uh, multiple different types of weapons within the game. Pulse rifles, which are burst fire rifles that do good damage at medium range. You have um, auto rifles, which are basically your standard full auto assault rifles. Scout rifles, which function like DMRs and or semi-auto assault rifles. Then you have hand cannons, which are heavy hitting revolvers. And these are all the primary weapons you can get. Your secondaries, or special weapons as they're called in this game which require the, um, a different type of ammo called special ammo. These involve sidearms, which are basically, like, you know, standard pistols. Um, sniper rifles, shotguns, a fusion rifle, which is a charged up, um, it's basically like a shotgun that charges up before it fires, but it does more damage and has better range, and they shoot like plasma. Um, then you have, um in the heavy category which is basically like power weapons uh, basically they're like your big heavy hitting weapons but they drop the least ammo or their ammos drop the least often and the least amount these include LMGs swords and rocket launchers um, now there are certain weapons that break this mold like um, exotics there is an exotic um, shotgun which can be equipped in the primary slot there is a, an exotic fusion rifle that is a heavy weapon so on and so forth but generally this is how it works um as for well as for the rest of it i'll talk about characters now um there are three characters in the game warlock titan and hunter um you will only see warlock gameplay here because i was leveling up my warlock at the time i was recording all this um, and each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses, as well as each, um, character has, um, three subclasses to it based on the three elements, Void, Arc, and Solar. These are basically fire, electricity, and, like, I guess you'd call it, like, I don't know, like, black hole energy, I guess would be the closest you can equate to Void. Um... But effectively, each subclass has their own super, which is basically like an ultimate in other video games, like character-based video games. Each of them have their own choice of three unique grenades for their own subclass, so nine grenades in total for each, um, because of all these. And then finally, to finish off, we have the, um, we have what is the final thing about them and that is that each one has their own skill tree which do certain things um you'll see a sneak pe sneak peep of it here you have to level up the subclass to get more stuff and i guess i'll go over what these subclasses are so the there are three subclasses for each one like i said and i'll go over them now so warlock has void walker which is a build basically based around um using grenades and other um yeah, using grenades and their super to basically explode the battlefield and keep uh, and do mass amounts of AOE damage at once. Solar is um, called um, Sunsinger. This build bases around using um, damage over time effects with solar grenade with um, fire grenades, 
as well as um, supporting the team through the use through the use of radiance, which allows them to um, which allows them to basically um, increase the charge rate of all their abilities by a shit ton, as well as give them a bit of extra health and armor while it's active. Um, they also have abilities to allow them to res from the dead using the ability, stuff like that. Um, the Voidwalker, I forgot to mention, its ultimate is a massive bomb that explodes and disintegrates anything it touches. And then finally we have, um, it's not Arc Strider, um, Storm Trans, yeah, it's, well, the ability is called Storm Trans, I forget what the exact, um, subclass name is. But simply put, you, you're you based around Chain Lightning and making sure that you are basically flowing like a storm, basically. And your ultimate is a is a massive, um, you become basically Emperor Palpatine, but floating. So you basically float around with increased movement speed and you get to Chain Lightning between people consistently like a um, full auto, basically it's full auto Chain Lightning is the closest I can explain it to. Um, you also gain bonus armor and stuff like that, while it's active. Um, to go on to the Titan, you have Striker, which basically you're based around being in the fray, punching, meleeing, and your big ability, which is called Fist of Havoc, you slam the ground, sort of like Gravity Spikes and Call of Duty if you've ever seen them, and unleash a massive arc, which is electricity, um, explosion around you that basically blows up anything near it. Um, Defender, um, is the Void one, simply put, you are based around keeping yourself alive, you're meant to basically tank damage a bit, and then your, your ultimate allows you to, um, create a bubble that provides buffs for you and your teammates while they're either in it or they pass through it, as well as obviously, like, you know, protect from damage and so on and so stuff while you're in it. Um, the final subclass is called, um, Sunbreaker. This is a class basically based around um, chaining ability, chaining fire abilities together, as well as their fi their ultimate being um, a hammer that they invoke that they can continue throwing, and then they explode in for in basically solar energy. Um, so yeah, that's Titan. It's overall they're the most easy to understand. Finally, we have hunters, which have their three. Um, Gun, I think it's Gunslinger, yeah. Um, Gunslinger, they're based around getting precision, basically getting, um, precision shots, so headshots, so on, stuff like that. As well as doing, um, as well as, well, basically, they're just meant on being precise and making sure they always hit their shots. Um, that's their main thing, and their ultimate is called the Golden Gun. Simply put, they pull out a soldier, a solar-charged hand cannon... That basically obliterates anything that that obliterates whatever it shoots at, and you get three shots with it, or four if you have like a special um, a special um, exotic. But and it does massive damage to things that won't get one shot by it. And it's simply put, it's a precision weapon that as long as you hit the target, you kill them 90% of the time, unless they're obviously a boss or like a major or something like that. And then um, or they deal massive damage. Next up is the Blade Dancer. Um, this is the Electric slash Arc subclass. This subclass um, is based around stealth to an extent. Simply put, they have a lot of abilities based around being stealthy, being very fast. Um, abilities such as Fast Hands that make you swap weapons faster. Um, there's another ability which allows you to stealth when you've been crouched for a certain duration. Um, another, um, well, their ultimate consists of a blade that they pull out that is charged with arc energy and when it hits targets it disintegrates them with arc so basically they die they turn into electricity and their whole um abilities with that are based around either making it do um better damage against multiple people or making it to where they can um continue their rampage with the blade for much longer the final subclass that we'll be talking about is the night stalker this is the hunter, sort of, as you would expect. Um, based around tracking and holding down areas in very, um, in very bad situations. Um, such as having smoke that does da corrosive damage to those who run through it. Or, ba or basically they poison enemies while they run through it. 
um, grenades that stay alive longer. They have the ability to cloak um, on demand while it's moving and then can move around with it. And their final ability, which is very, very on theme for them, probably the most on theme in all of the of all of them, is the um, what we like to call the shadow shot. Now this is a bow that gets shot. Um, it can have one or three rounds depending on what abilities you put on it. And um, the ability which you see right there, shadow shot, um, is a bow that fires one to three shots. And what this does is, is that it hits a target. Um, if it hits a target, it is an insta kill, um, unless they're also in a super. And then it, what it does is it tethers and suppresses enemies. So suppression means they can no longer use abilities, um, and they take, um, yeah, they cannot use abilities, and they're basically sitting ducks. And they also have a um, a slight filter over their screen to make it harder to see. And the tether effect makes it to where they are stuck to the um, to the tether, meaning that they move slower. And obviously they stay suppressed for as long as the tether is on them and a couple seconds afterwards. So that is all the subclasses. Um, next we'll go on to the weapons. So every weapon has a power level as displayed on the weapon. As well as they're all a part of one of these weapons I talked about earlier. Um, there are also archetypes within those weapons that do um, you know, increasing fire rate or increasing damage, lowering fire rate, so on and so forth. Um, and each weapon can spawn with a certain set of perks. So these perks are random, but they are not completely random, meaning that there are certain perks that can only spawn on certain weapons, and or there are certain um, a certain group of perks that can spawn in a certain slot on a certain weapon. These perks can range from anything such as getting more damage upon getting kills. Um, others can be such as... Um, Delay, or such as reloading faster, having increased ability. Um, each weapon has the option between a barrel or a scope that is basically predetermined on the weapon. Barrels can obviously increase, you know, um, they increase damage range or um, reduce stability, but they all generally have trade offs. So, like, you can increase the damage and range of your shotgun, but it kicks a lot harder, so on and so forth. Um, scopes as well, they simply, they can add better range to the weapon for less stability, or they can add more stability, less range, um, for less aim assist on the weapon, so on and so forth. Um, so it's really a guessing game as to how they work, um, sometimes because you kind of have to experiment. Um, like I said, then there are special perks, some, um, which are what I like to call the less per the lesser perks. These ones give you stats such as, um, Reduce magazine size for better range and damage, or for better range and um, stability. As where you have other ones where they can do things like skip rounds, which you'll see right here, which allow you to carry more um, ammo, but and they also allow you to um, ricochet ammo off of wall or ricochet rounds off of walls, so on and so forth. Um, then you have other perks, which I like to call the. Um, the high-end perks, which are perks that give you bigger, um, much bigger bonuses, such as crowd control, which once I, which like I said, gives you bonus damage upon get it for a couple seconds after getting a kill. Feeding frenzy, which gives you increased reload after getting a kill. Head seeker, which is a pulse rifle only. Um, getting um, missing shot, um, hitting body shots gives you increased damage on the next headshot you deal. Um, Unflinching, you no longer um, you take reduced flinch while um, getting shot at, so on and so forth. So exotics are also a thing, and there are also legendaries that have specific perks. So raid weapons and and or like mission weapons can sometimes have specific perks that only drop to them. A good example would be the guy the um the legendary auto rifle from the raid wrath of the machine, known as Genesis Chain. Which what Genesis Chain does is that um. It has, um, it has a ability called, um, I believe it's Slowed Firefly or something like that. Basically, the weapon has a slower fire while it's aimed on sights, which is a standard perk that all weapons can give. But while it's firing in that slower fire rate, it can also cause explosions upon headshots that deal bonus damage. Compared to the base perk Firefly, which just does an explosion when you get a headshot kill. Um, so on and so forth. 
Then you have exotics, which are a tier above all weapons. Um, you can only equip one of these, one armor piece, one um, weapon at a time, and these all have very, very unique perks to them. A good example would be um, Galahorn, which is the most famous one of all exotics. This weapon has, this is a rocket launcher that tracks, but upon exploding, it releases little wolf pack rounds, which are like little seeker drone thingies. And these um, basically puncture the target and keep hitting them for a small duration before stopping. Um, another good example of one would be the Zalo Supercell. This is a weapon that, um, on hitting targets, has the ability, has a chance to chain lightning between nearby targets, and then getting double kills with the weapon refills a portion of its magazine and allows you to, um, it gives you bonus super energy, which gives you more energy for your ultimate that you can use. And this is sort of how the game functions, um, is based around getting these weapons with, and getting the normal legendaries to have great perks, while keeping up their power level through the effect of infusion. Which infusion basically says you cough up a bit of resources and a weapon of higher power level to, and you basically dismantle it, um, or you destroy it in order to give a weapon that you want more power level to be the same power level and or slightly more than the weapon used. So a good example would be, um, if I have a power level 370 weapon that I want to upgrade and there's a power level 400 weapon, I can dismantle it, or I can um, use the infusion mechanic on the 370 one. It will get rid of the 400 power level item, but it will give make my the weapon that I had now be power level 400. And that's how that's similar to how the sand. That's pretty much how the sandbox works. Um, this is very very condensed, by the way, guys. So obviously there's a lot more that I'm not going over but this is just a base overview of it. <coughs> and so finally, I will do the finishing touch, which is I shall talk about what I like about this game, why I dislike about this game, and somewhat of its rocky past. Okay, guys, for the final stretch, I'll talk about what are some of my criticisms of this game, and quite a few, and there are quite a few, um, and this is what makes this game not for all players. So firstly, we'll talk about raiding. Simply put, it is very difficult to find a raid on this game nowadays, and with the fact of Trials and Iron Banner being gone, most content is relegated to you doing strikes and or having, you know, just one or two friends help you out do some of the other endgame content. <laughs> so a lot of the content that has made Destiny great no longer is available to a good chunk of the player base, which is quite sad. Um, that is the biggest criticism I have, at least now. The rest of them are old criticisms that obviously have never been addressed. Um, the biggest criticism I'll talk about is mission design slash storytelling. Oh my god, y'all are gonna love this. So, <coughs> the biggest criticism of any Destiny player to this game is a lack of good functional storytelling. Um, simply put, up until the Taken King, there has not been one insanely good story arc or story made in game a lot of them are made outside of the game through the grimoire system which if you guys don't know what that is basically that score is you getting um by completing missions and doing challenges or secret things you get grimoire cards and you have to access these through um uh, bungie's website read them and use them to Basically, you just read lore pages and stuff like that. The issue with this is that most people are not connected with the lore in-game very much. Um, and with this and very dry missions, aside from, like I said, up to the Taken King, overall, the story up until the Taken King is quite bad. Obviously, I'm talking about the Taken King a lot. That is because this, um, instead of giving us an ambiguous enemy called the Darkness and or giving us very, very small storylines that don't do very much. Cough, cough, the dark below. Literally only three story missions and a raid. Um, overall, there's a lot less storytelling, but in the Taken King, however, like I said, um, they now finally gave us a good villain who has done a lot in-game, 
who pre presents us with a very, very real threat, and not only do we fight him in the final story mission of the game, we also figure out due to the complex mechanics of their alien race, we are also we must also fight them once more, uh, or we must also fight him once more in the in the final raid for the expan or just the raid for the expansion, and he is the final boss. So there's a lot building up, and then you thought you defeat him, and then they're like, "Oh, psych! No, he ain't dead. You gotta fight. You got You haven't fought him in his true form yet." And now you must fight, like, you know, he will be your ultimate challenge for this expansion. And it's really, really good, especially because they set up the writing in a way that makes it to where there's still a lot of things that um, we don't know about, such as, like, Nocris, who we learned about in Destiny 2, um, although in a kind of shitty way, but regardless. Um, among other things, such as him talking about how you killed Crota, and how he's going to steal every single, he's going to make everything uh, bow to his will, stuff like that. So it's a very it's a very good story, and that's sort of where the the rest of the story takes place is uh, is in that sort of mode. Rise of Iron shows a little bit of a dip in story, but it's not bad enough to where I hate it. Um, regardless, though, um, that's it for really the story. The story just has a lot of flaws. Like I said, only two of them being even, being what I would call satisfactory to, in telling an actual narrative. Um, there are some side quest lines that can give you it just by their mission text and or by them being exotic quests that can tell you some good stories. Um, my two favorites being Gallahorn and um, No Time to Explain because they teach you about characters in the story as well as giving you an actual like, they give you like a legitimate challenge in trying to get the weapon. Um, another good one is the Kvastov, which basically harkens back to the very beginning of the game, giving you some sort of nostalgia. And then we have my... the other half of the gripe, which is mission design. So, mission design is very repetitive in Destiny. <laughs> Simply put, it is generally one of three things. One, go find and kill boss. Two, defend waves of enemies and or do some side objective while you're doing it, while you're defending it, said waves of enemies. And or three, you are going to find certain item, then bring item to certain place, do something with certain item in certain place, and then you shall proceed. And that is legitimately how most of it goes. It's either a fetch quest, a kill quest, or it's a defend. And this gets quite boring real fast, although there are some good ones out there, um, namely Lost to Light, and um, the one before that, I forget, or no, it is... It's just Lost to Light, and then there was one more that I'm thinking of. And both were in the Taken King, mind you. One of them made it to where you complete the mission, you get the fetch quest done, but then your comms are locked down, and you must run away from a from a onslaught of Taken, and you must then use certain items frantically, and you must navigate through these tunnels in the alien um, stronghold to escape. Then, once you escape... Um, you go on to the next mission, which is Lost to Light. I believe, or no, it's not Lost to Light. It might, no, it's um, Ascendancy or something like that. But basically, in that mission, you are stealth for the entirety for the entirety of the mission. So basically, you are cloaked, and you must avoid, um, you must avoid being um, smelled out by the aliens. So therefore, you must, you know, dodge and weave and like you know solve through the puzzles of what was actually a raid location. Then once you get there, you must collect the essence of one of the raid bosses you canonically kill in the storyline. Then you must hold out as and uh, as you are found out and a massive horde is unleashed against you that is way too powerful for you. So basically you're just struggling to survive for a couple minutes until you are frantically pulled out by one of your um, teammates who, yeah, or from one of your, um, I guess you call them friends or com companions within the game who uses a teleport magic. So like I said, there are some good missions in here. The strikes are a lot better than most of the others, but generally the average storytelling and mission design is very bland and very annoying. Also very repetitive. Um, that's the main way I can talk about Destiny's story missions are they are repetitive. Um, 
and I guess that can lead me into my last thing, and that is that it, a very repetitive game. Simply put, um, when leveling up, there is a lot you can do, and same thing with like the some of the leveling um, during some of the leveling areas. But once you get to the point of around 350 to, or no, more like 360 light, um, you start basically just doing some of most of the end end game stuff, and that is it. And the issues without, you know, consistently being able to raid, and also having the fact of, um, people just simply not having the, how I say, there's not as many people playing the game since Destiny 2 is out. There is a lot of, um, basically it becomes a lot harder to do some of the end game content. So generally you're stuck around doing Nightfalls, Strikes, Crucible, and like some of the other PvE modes, and that's it. So overall, it's just a, well, as you do have options, it's just a very repetitive thing, and only certain gear can drop from certain places, so. Outside of exotic quests, there's not really much unique things you end up doing after you get to a certain point in the game. Overall, with that, and the very shitty early on um, gameplay of this game, up until you got to, like I said, the Taken King, which is where it took off, that DLC basically saved this game. Um... Up to that point, this game was very, very bad in my opinion, and I would not have bought it. As for today, the game comes with Rise of Iron if you buy it, unless you have, like, a super, super old version that you buy off somebody, which is, like, only the base game, and that's it. Which actually has, there's actually some funny reasons to actually buy the base game, which I'll, which I won't mention, but regardless. Um, overall, nowadays, I say this game is worth a grab. There's a lot of depth into the game, and if you're willing to look at the lore through, or if you're willing to get the stories that are talked about in this game through other means than simply, you know, playing the game in some cases, you can get a lot of very good enjoyment out of this game. And overall, if you're just a looter shooter fan, I recommend this game just because it's a fun grind, and it's one of the few games I have put in hundreds of hours into without giving shit about the lore for half the time. With that being said, in a star rating out of 10, I will give this weapon, I will give this, this interstellar galactic freaking shit show a 8 out of 10. Simply put, the game is addicting, there is a lot to do within your leveling process and how you play the game. Um, it feels good, the game is polished, the game is fun. And while it does have repetitiveness issues and story time issues, overall the ga the interesting gameplay loop of this game allows you to look past that in very many cases and still play the game very well. Um, overall, yeah, I would, like I said, this game is worth a buy, especially with how cheap it is now. And I definitely think you guys should give this game a chance. That being said, this is Desmond12530 signing off. Hopefully you enjoyed the review, and I'll be seeing you guys all later. Thank you.